Series W5. I found a lot of dogs suffering. Uncovering the terrible treatment of Canada's working dogs. Nobody thinks they would have to shoot a dog. I had to find out if this was true. Would you consider your kennel to be a safe place for your dogs to be? And the Ian I knew, he wasn't there anymore. A hard-hitting career leads to a devastating addiction. In a locker room, if a guy came and needed something for pain, guys would get it. I didn't know how bad it actually was. Hangover, painkiller. Sore thumb, painkiller. Here is Avery Haynes. Welcome to W5. It's a major tourist draw in this country, but is it humane? W5's Molly Thomas goes inside the controversial world of dog sledding. A hidden camera investigation raises disturbing questions about whether the industry is putting dollars over dogs. Born to run, that's how these majestic animals are often described. Wild and seemingly happy, sled dogs are an obvious and adorable money maker for companies trying to attract tourists. These dogs are considered working dogs in Canada. But what people see on the sled is sometimes only half the story. I spent pretty much almost a year total uh, crossing the country in trying to get as many uh, companies as possible. Armed with his drone, animal activist Francis Mativier set out to see what was happening in the dog sled industry. He flew his drone 66 times over 30 kennels in Canada, searching for sled dogs in rural and remote areas of Saskatchewan, to densely forested kennels tucked away in quaint parts of Quebec, to large operations closer to city life in Ontario. He even went out in the summer to kennels nestled in the beautiful Rocky Mountains of Alberta to see how these dogs live when they're not pulling a sled. I found a lot of dogs suffering, that's for sure. And I saw dogs, you know, shivering in the cold. Some were scared, some were um, pacing back and forth nonstop over and over again and they were all really desperate for affection. I could see it. Mativier also used trail cams and even climbed up trees with spy cams to figure out how sled dogs spend their days. He says he found roughly 2,000 dogs tied to metal chains with nowhere to go, exhibiting troubling repetitive behavior. And from above, you can see all those little circle and all these circles are dogs just going around and around nonstop. That's what they do pretty much all day. That's their lives. That's their lives. So when they're not uh, pulling sled for the company to make profit from, they're chained to their pole. One of those sites surveyed near Quebec City had something worse on the ground. In February 2020, there was talk of a homemade gas chamber reportedly used to kill sled dogs. I had to find out if this, this was true, that this guy had built this gas chamber and was gassing puppies. Fern Levitt is an animal activist and filmmaker who was first tipped off by a former employee. This guy told me the owner of this sled dog company had built his own gas chamber and was gassing the unwanted dogs and puppies and he saw the brutal treatment of those dogs there. And so what happened is he wrote a very detailed report to the SPCA in Quebec and to the Ministry of Agriculture, who were supposed to be doing investigations if there are concerns about dog abuse. And they didn't do anything. The Quebec government and local SPCA would neither confirm nor deny if they investigated this claim. Fern decided to look into it herself. The employee drew her a map to Expedition Milou near Quebec, showing her exactly where to go in the dark. And so I asked some of my friends if they would come with me, and we drove from Toronto to Quebec um, and got there at midnight. And um, 
went inside. What she found and photographed in February of 2020 shocked her. What I saw was this plastic box, just a box that I would pack my kids' clothes in at camp. So at first, when I first saw it, I thought, this can't be it. And then I saw a line leading to a canister that had a message on it that said this was gas. Animals disposable with a single hose connected to a canister of welding gas. And then another grim discovery. And then in the very next room was a freezer. And we opened up the freezer, and it was full of puppies and a couple of adult dogs. And the puppies looked like they were sleeping. Except, of course, they wouldn't. They were on ice. That was hidden from the public's eyes. However, this video was filmed by a tourist showing an employee of the same company hitting a dog as he tries to attach a harness. This type of behavior and the gruesome findings remind Fern of the worst massacre of sled dogs in Canadian history back in 2010. To a disturbing story now from British Columbia, an investigation is underway into what some are calling a horrifying act of animal cruelty. It involves 100 sled dogs that were slaughtered near Whistler, B.C. last April. A tragedy unfolded when the Vancouver Olympics ended and the tourism industry slowed. It was exceptionally traumatic for our whole team. Marcy Moriarty is the Chief Prevention and Enforcement Officer for the BCSPCA. This was a result of a quote-unquote a surplus situation of a business that was there to serve, you know, human entertainment. And the killing, of course, is absolutely tragic. She was part of an investigative team that had the painstaking job of digging up the corpses of dogs. Most were shot at point-blank range and left behind in a mass grave. You said it was tragic, but was it legal? Uh, it, it wasn't legal. What changed after that? The BC government uh, did act quickly to convene a task force which would set out standards for sled dog operations. And that's the only code of practice in the whole country. That's the only code of practice I'm aware of that's entrenched in law, yes. Moriarty says the BC Code provides the bare minimum protections for sled dogs, including appropriate tether length, what kind of housing they need, and how to humanely euthanize them. Every other province relies on basic animal welfare laws. Do you worry that other places in the country don't have anything to protect these dogs? Absolutely. Um, and I think in complete honesty, while we have a sled dog code and it in our legislation, legislation's only as good as enforcement and proactive inspections. So this is not a system that is um, proactively inspected, like, you know, a daycare system or a, um, uh, even a restaurant food safety inspection. That can lead to questionable conditions until there is a complaint. This is Spirit of the North Kennels in Salmo, B.C., where in 2021, the SPCA says they found large amounts of feces around dogs, with many on chains too short, violating the B.C. sled dog code of practice. Forty dogs were seized. An animal welfare panel ruled that the care was not adequate to ensure the dogs would remain free of distress. Spirit of the North disputes the SPCA findings, saying there was not one valid reason for them to take the dogs. The company continues to challenge this in court. Over in Ontario, pushback from sled dog owners who say they were properly caring for their dogs. Back up, please. And you Back up, please. Come out. Okay. We're going to just move on. We're going to do the inspection today. That's what we're here for. Which our lawyers told you that there's no need for this. W5 obtained body cam footage and images from the raid of Windrift Adventures, where inspectors say they found dog chains not long enough for Ontario regulations. Shavings are wet. The shavings. Some leaking structures with wet walls and not enough bedding for the dogs. So I'm going to put that that there is bedding, but it's minimal, okay? Because it is present. The owners, Adrian Spottiswood and Thomas Pride, had been ordered by the province to fix these problems before. 
If you want, you're in non-compliance. Yeah. To the animals are being removed today. No, they're not. No, they're, yes, they're not. Are. I'm not relinquishing them. I'm not relinquishing them. You don't have a choice either. in that. Hundreds of dogs and puppies were removed. An adjudicator looked at the evidence and ruled that 11 puppies could go back to that kennel. But more than 200 dogs were found to be in distress and remain in provincial care. Windrift continues to appeal this removal. Coming up. We were only two staff taking care of 250 dogs. Life off the lead. They sleep, they defecate, they eat all in the same area. When W5 continues. For hundreds of years, dog sledding has been a way of life for Indigenous people, providing them with necessities in harsh Canadian winters. But now, it's become a popular tourism industry. Chantal Dosteller was a musher at a now defunct kennel in central Ontario. As the driver of the dog sled, she was also the main caretaker of the dog's day-to-day -day needs, even when there was no snow. We were only two staff taking care of 250 dogs. Two for 250. Yeah. Is that, hum is that humane? I mean, you're working front line with them. Humane to who? <laughs> Can you take care of that many dogs, like give them the proper kind of care? What's your perspective of proper care? Right. Right? I thought it was really insulting that dogs only got one hour off their chain a month in the summertime. I think that was really disrespectful. One hour of freedom a month. Things started to be said around me that were alarming, such as feed them as little as possible to save money, you know, but not so much that the SPCA gets called. And as a primary caregiver of the dogs, it was really offensive. For years, when tourists asked her about the health of the dogs, she says she lied because she needed the job. So a vet would come around to see these dogs, oh. hundreds of dogs. Mm -hmm. how, how many times? Twice a year. Twice a year yeah. for hundreds of working dogs. Yeah. And when dogs got sick, it wasn't an option to bring the dog to the vet. They would get hidden in the back of the kennel so people driving by wouldn't see it. And then Chantal says an end for any dogs management felt were too sick or couldn't pull their own weight. Twice a year, they would hire a hitman. We had seen a mass, mass uh, shooting. They would shoot dogs, spring and the fall. But all the dogs, you can imagine hundreds of dogs barking and the bark was really high pitched, a lot of panic. And you're taking the dogs and you're bringing them to this man and you'd hear the, and then you'd hear the drop of the body onto the next. When management wanted to save money, Chantel says they asked their staff to do the dirty work. You had to do the unthinkable, Chantel. Because it was a lot for me. I was still very young. I'm still young. But uh, yeah, I took the gun, took the bullets, went to the yard. I brought Hope. She tells us Hope was a sled dog that had been sick for four days. I walked her down to the pit and uh, nobody had instructed me how to euthanize a dog with a gun. And so I shot her in the back of the head, point blank. It definitely broke my heart. It broke part of my spirit to, to like, who am I? Who am I to have euthanized a dog for my employer? You know, why wasn't there vets around? Did you ever think coming into this job you would have to shoot a dog? Nobody thinks that way. Nobody thinks they would have to shoot a dog when they become a dog sled guide. Nobody. For dogs still working in other large operations in Canada, many spend their days tethered to poles, pacing in circles. This hidden camera footage over a 12-hour period shows sled dogs never leaving their chains. And it appears none of the dogs caught on camera had any food or water replenished in the freezing conditions. I, I cannot understand how this is legal and, and accepted and how people can treat their dogs like that. To me, it's, 
absolutely unacceptable. This is Francis Mativier protesting outside a dog sled kennel in Canmore, Alberta. He's an animal activist that has surveyed 30 dog sled operations across Canada and is concerned that working dogs are getting the short end of the stick. They sleep, they defecate, they urinate, they eat, all in the same area. In the same circle, basically? Yes. So it was dirty. Oh, it's, uh, yeah, it's disgusting, yeah. If they say dogs are a man's best friend, who would want to chain his best friend outside like that for 95% of their lives? Rebecca Ledger is a clinical animal behaviorist and welfare scientist based in British Columbia. She has testified at dozens of court cases, some criminal, on whether animals are in distress. When I see a dog that has been on a tether for a prolonged period and has started to display abnormal behaviors, stereotypic pacing and circling, then yes, I'm concerned that that animal is suffering. Are they scared? Are they anxious? Are they in pain? So suffering refers to the, all of those negative experiences that animals can have. Rebecca acknowledges that no federal legislation specifically states that dogs can't be kept on tethers all day long. If we're putting a dog into any situation where it is suffering and the, the person in control, the caregiver, is aware of that, then that is illegal. When we see promotional videos, of these sled dogs, they're, they're running. You know, Canadians are sold this impression that they're happy. Mm. Are they? There seems to be no doubt that dogs, sled dogs love to run. Mm -hmm. um, they love to be with their pack. They love the opportunity to interact with their handlers and, and, and tourists in that moment. Um, but when they're not right, racing, when they're not pulling sleds, then uh, there are very few opportunities for joy and many opportunities for dogs to suffer. Marcy Moriarty is the Chief Prevention and Enforcement Officer for the BCSPCA and questions the amount of time sled dogs spend on a tether. Sled dog owners, you know, that we talked to have said, these are the Olympic athletes of dogs. And so why would you put them on a tether? <laughs> well, they love, they love what they do. So why can't we, you know, they're not like your average dog that's in your home. What would you say to that? I've always found that the most incredible statement to say these dogs are born to run. They love to run. Of course they do. I don't question that. Then why in the world would you put them on a tether and leave them there for the vast majority of their day? It's counterintuitive. W5 tried to contact the Canadian Coalition for Sled Dogs, but we never heard back. We later found out the organization has been disbanded. Coming up. You spend your entire days in those dog yards. It definitely is a lifestyle. Are the basic rules for care being followed? Are you arguing that the dogs are not in distress? Oh, absolutely. When W5 continues. Thousands of tourists flock to Canada each year to experience one of our oldest and coldest traditions. Alaskan and Siberian Huskies pulling paid customers on a sled. It's an industry that's present in every province. But animal advocates are questioning whether we should pull the plug and reconsider using animals for this kind of entertainment. Remember the gas chamber? reportedly used to kill sled dogs, discovered at Expedition Milou in Quebec? We asked Rebecca Ledger about it. She is a globally recognized expert on the suffering of animals. In my opinion, there are ways to euthanize animals that cause significantly less suffering than gassing. And experiencing um, oxygen deprivation is considered uh, in animal welfare to be one of the worst forms of suffering. I'm very disappointed to hear that um, dogs are being euthanized in this method in Canada. Quebec doesn't technically outlaw euthanasia of dogs by gas, but Quebec's Veterinary Association says this welding gas is unacceptable for dogs. This type of euthanasia is considered too painful. Expedition Milou, the company that reportedly had a gas chamber on site in February of 2020, 
claims it's under new ownership. W5 reached out to the new owner, Tanya Fournier-Villeu, several times for an interview. She stopped answering our calls but provided this statement. I don't want to be a part of your story if it's to speak about the last owners and absolutely false allegations. But when we called, this is what happened. Molly Thomas from CTV calling. Just hoping I can I can chat with the owner. I just have some questions for them. Okay, yeah, but it's me. Who am I speaking to? Elizabeth. Elizabeth, you're the owner of Milu? Yeah, but we are three people, so I'm uh, one of the three. One of the three owners, gotcha. I'm just wondering if, if that's something that's still going on, especially the gassing of the no. dogs. No, 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 no. So when did that stop? Elizabeth hung up. W5 uncovered incorporation documents that show Elizabeth Leclerc and Antoine Simard, who were in charge when the gas chamber was found, are still involved in the dog sled operation. In Ontario, one of its largest dog sled companies is quiet these days. After the province removed more than 200 dogs, with an adjudicator on the Animal Welfare Tribunal ruling they were in distress. The owners, Adrian Spottiswood and Thomas Pride, had missed the provincial deadline to make changes. Animal welfare inspectors measured and found chains too short. It's about a half inch. Interior walls are wet. Some houses had leaks and inadequate bedding. So I'm going to put that, that there is bedding, but it's minimal. We tried to reach Windrift multiple times through phone calls, email, and even a courier. We never heard back, so showed up at their home, which is also tied to the dog sled business. What's up? I'm Molly Thomas from CTV's W5, and okay. we've tried many ways to try to contact you folks. So we're willing to do an interview, but not at this moment. Okay, well, when would that, when could that happen? Things escalated quickly. That's what we're trying to understand. So why are you showing up? Why are you just showing up? Why are you just showing up? This is sick. This we're is trying to get your side of the story. Why would you, we're trying to be we're fair. To give it to you, but, but to we're show not up like give this? It to you when you show up at our property. We left with no answers. Yep. Okay, let's this go. Is w let's go. Family. An hour later, they called and agreed to sit down with us, so we drove back north two days later. Adrian would do the interview with her husband and business partner taping our conversation. Help me understand, what does it take to run an operation, a uh, dog sled operation with, you know, over 200 dogs? If dogs are barking at two in the morning, you're going down to see what's going on. You spend your entire days in those dog yards. So um, it definitely is a lifestyle. Would you consider uh, your kennel to be a safe place for your dogs to be? Absolutely. And why would you say that? Um, because we follow all the standards of care for sled dogs. So when you say standards of care, where are you pulling that from? From the regulation in Ontario. Okay, so um, you were issued orders from, from Ontario yeah. um, last summer to, to make some changes. Some of them included, you know, longer chains for your dogs, mm -hmm. insulation, better insulation for their homes. Um, why not make those changes? When you look at the average sled dog, they're about their stride is about a meter. Mm -hmm. So if you have a three meter chain, they get to their fastest speed within two strides. That's how fast they go. So if you um, have them on a three meter chain, they're hitting the end of that chain at full speed, which can then break their neck. Spottiswood pointed to the BC Sled Dog Code of Practice for perspective. It says a tether should be at least 1.83 meters, a minimum, not a maximum. But she has other concerns with the adjudicator's ruling involving insulation of dog houses. If you had experts telling you that if you do something, you're, it could kill your dog, how would you, like, what would you do? So you think extra insulation is going to kill your dog? You think that I think extra taking care of nails on dog houses is going to kill your dog? I think insulation in the summer, if you put straw in a house in the summer and insulation on the roof, that the heat can't escape and the dogs won't use their house. And we need the dogs to use their house. That's what it's there for. The majority of your dogs you don't have. Right. So unless you make some of these changes, 
I mean, it doesn't look like you'll get them back. Well, we are appealing the decision. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that the judge is wrong in her determination? Yeah. Shouldn't this be then, a, uh, I mean, an industry-wide uproar over this? Like, why are you the only people that are in court over this issue? Because we're the only ones targeted by the government. Windrift's owners maintain there's a concerted effort by animal welfare to target their operation. When we moved to the province's third order of more bedding, the conversation took a turn. But that doesn't say that they weren't provided bedding. Well, it says that they need to have an adequate and appropriate resting area. And so, they do. Like, I guess I'm trying to understand, Adrian. Are you telling me I'm every... sorry, can we just stop? Because I really feel like you're just coming at me. I'm really not trying to, Adrian. Can you just stop filming, please? I'm just trying to understand, like... Can you please just stop? Stop filming now. Stop filming now. Folks, I'm, I am oh, just... No, stop it! Stop it! I'm only going by the documents. We tried to continue our interview. Yeah, Sir, this is what the judge... Just stop! We're getting, we're getting answers on, on... You're not getting answers. Sorry, I'm just going to have to make a phone call to my lawyer for a moment. Can you please? <laughs> this is W5. Stop it. No, no, Folks, we're trying to understand. You're you're not, we're you're trying not. to understand what your issues are with each of these orders from the province. Adrian never sat back down with us, but instead passed us on to her lawyer, Eric Gillespie. So Eric, are you arguing that the dogs are not in distress? Oh, absolutely, because I think the starting point is there's never been a dog that's been found that has any significant health issues. Distress is defined broadly in Ontario to include proper care, water, food, or shelter. The legislation says you have to go a bit further and look at what kind of dog it is. Eric, it sounds to me like, like your client is, is almost trying to create new laws, maybe, maybe better provisions for sled dogs. Isn't that a political fight? Well. I think it absolutely is. So I think the government has recognized that there really is a problem in the legislation, that it's not one size fits all, and that we are gonna to have to look at some changes. Since the removal, Windriff says five adult dogs and four puppies have died in the province's care. And of the 11 dogs that came back to them, some were much thinner than when they left. Others had Girardia, and almost all required immediate veterinary attention. The province refused to comment, saying the matter is before the court. Eric, you know, we've been looking at sled dog operations across the country. Do you think, you know, when you look at this case, like, that this puts a negative light on, on the tourism industry? I think sled dogging in jurisdictions that understand sled dogging is well reg regulated and working well for everybody. Not everybody agrees. And unfortunately, it seems to continue to be a problem across Canada. Marcy Moriarty with the BCSPCA claims small kennels with under 15 dogs are the only ones that can get the animal welfare model right. She says it's up to tourists to determine whether this industry should continue. It frustrates me. It frustrates me that these dogs are really the pawns in a... Um, at a tourist industry that I'd question the relevance of. Does Canada need national standards on this issue? I absolutely, you know, I'm a, a believer in national standards uh, on this, but I also think that I wouldn't want to give a sense, a false sense of security, that simply because national standards are passed, that Canadians should feel confident that those standards are being adhered to. Windrift Adventures is appealing the removal of their animals and is still fighting the province to have their dogs returned.